Welcome to another episode of Slates and Coffee, guys. We have been on a roll. It feels like this whole journey I have been healing. I don't know about you guys, but you got your girl Toy Mason. You got NECA and you got Sequoia, our co-hosts for the evening. Today's topic is self-care. Um, shoot, I, honestly, you know, me being a mom and a wife, I lost my way. And then having projects. And as a creator, I don't know how if you guys feel the same way, but as a creator, it's a different realm. Like, you really got to tap out of your titles as NECA or as Takoya, and you got to dive into the realm of creating because we know creating is not about us. It's about others, right? So self-care plays a huge part in that because if our mental and physical and spiritual is not together, then everything else kind of like off balance. What you guys think? I agree. Um, I realized that when I don't meditate and when I don't connect with my ancestors and take time and connect with with my higher self I'm discombobulated and I can't get the messages that I'm supposed to receive to help me with my creative writing right and um, they remind me they're like hey <laughs> stop what you're doing right now and I you know center yourself and when I do it it's such a dramatic difference um, I know everybody has different belief systems, but the whole idea of just calming your your thoughts, it, it, it makes a great difference. Right. No, absolutely. I, I applaud that, first of all, because a lot of people forget you have to take time to like center yourself, reset, as some people say. Um, for me, I do something similar. I start every morning off with prayer and I'm at the end of the day, I do a Bible study. So that's why I'm every day, beginning and the end, I'm like centering, not centering, I guess resetting my mindset um, so that I'm not so taken up by the anxieties in this world, which can throw us left and right and all over. But at the end of the day, we only have so much control. Um, and on top of that, when you talk about self-care, which I know kind of bleeds into self-love, which we already talked about, but um, I feel like self-care is the practical aspect to self-love. And for the longest time, I used to like not think too much about it because I, I equated that with like access resources and money. Like, oh, I don't have money for spa date or like all these fancy products or a jade roller on my face. Time to even like spend, you know, going through all those rituals. But um, it is important to figure out in any way that you can with whatever budget you can whatever that means for you, whether that be a beauty regimen or like a mental, physical, spiritual thing you do. For me, I just literally a month ago implemented a spa day, which is actually my Sundays. So in the morning, I go through my whole regimen, taking care of myself, do a scrub, do a face mask, wash my hair, everything just to make sure I am ready for the next week. So I, I definitely encourage it. Make a spa day. <laughs> Yeah, and if, you know, and if you can't do, can't afford to do a spa day, I think that making your home, your environment, your mm -hmm. your peace haven, like your safe haven, like I'm starting to collect plants, um, mm -hmm. I'm starting to collect incense and candles and praying over my house. So when I step into different rooms, I feel that peace. Mm -hmm. So whatever phone call or meeting you're about to hop into via Zoom or the phone, you've already laid the foundation of that that peace, that environment. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, and then then your your diet plays a good part into it as well. Like they say uh, one of our guests, what was it, Janelle Johnson, what you put in your body is like medicine to your soul. Yeah. And I would also um, I would also add on to that, like 
you can set a day or time apart to do the major self-care, but really it's a continual thing. Yeah. All the different aspects of our life is just going to be self-care in different doses. And I think it really, like you were saying earlier about making the environment um, something that you're comfortable in. Yeah. This way you can have a continuous state of self-caring for yourself, knowing what your boundaries are and knowing what helps you check into yourself so that you can be prepared to interact with others, do business meetings, make major decisions and stuff. Mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's very it's something important. Very important. It's not just about the home, but how you interact with other people. So mm -hmm. self-care is also identifying those toxic people in your circle and in your life that doesn't benefit or serve your mental health. So if you have to excise them from your life, it can be hard and difficult, but it's necessary because of self-preservation. You have to think about yourself and if what they're bringing does not help that, you have to release them from your life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because not only do we have to be concerned about our inner circle, but sometimes we have to go on set and deal with a lot of other personalities that are not centered, that are not balanced. So if we're not centered and balanced at home, we take that same energy on set and it won't be really a peaceful environment for us and for mm -hmm. anyone else that's around us. So it's important to use our peaceful preservation to give it to others that need it, that don't think they need it or don't even know they need it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a guest um, today. She's beautiful. I met her on accident <laughs> earlier. <laughs> She's a beautiful soul that has entered into the slates. Um, her name is Nikki, but Takoya can tell more about her. Uh, so we are having Nikki Lachey come on as our guest today and I have not had the privilege of working with her, but she is a peer and a colleague, and she is an amazing actress, director, producer, host, uh, model. She does just about everything. So she's a multi hyphenate. And for those of you who are familiar with the show Bigger on BET Plus, she plays Sarita, and she also appeared on BMF on Stars. So we're glad to have her on to discuss self self hair and the projects that she has that deal exactly with that. Nikki! <laughs> Dang, I was scared. I was like, am I? <laughs> I was like, I'm going to just stay right here. Look at her. Hi! Gorgeous. She's taking up hey. the screen of beauty. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Um, as we discussed uh, previously, the topic of this episode is self-care. And um, we know that you have a very important project that you are doing that centers around self-care, specifically women, um, Black women. So we'd love to know more about that and how that ties in with um, how women can be more tuned in our body. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for having me here. I think this is a beautiful platform. Slates and coffee. What a great title. Um, so my project is called Medical Apartheid War of the Womb. And that stemmed from a personal experience I had regarding a fibroid diagnosis. And that diagnosis happened in 2020. And um just my journey um, to find a treatment option that worked for me um, kind of made me curious about what other women were going through when they were also seeking treatment options. And I just learned so much about how women, namely women of color, even more specific Black women were being handled in the midst of a crisis. And um, if we want to get even more specific, it's it boils down to are we being presented with our options? And uh, the answer is no, we're not. Oftentimes we're not being given our options so that we can make choices that are best for us. We are given the options that is best for the pockets of the surgeon. 
And um, some of us may not want surgery if we knew that we had the option to not get it. Some of us may not want hysterectomies if we knew that we did not have to get that. But because, you know, we have been kind of trained in a way, you know, to rely heavily on our doctors. They are, you know, we put our lives in their hands and um, they, we, we come to them with almost a, um, a false sense of, um, of hope that is really unrealistic for them to render. They have 15 minutes, each patient, they are human as well. Um, I guess once you see a certain amount of maybe death and, and pain, you become desensitized to a certain extent. So I think on both sides of the spectrum, there has to be responsibility taken on both ends. Now, how does that, how does this whole film relate to women's wellness and self-care? Well, I think that the most important, foundationally, the most important part of self-care is just to take responsibility for our own happiness, for our own wellness, by making the decision to say, you know, I'm worth this, you know, I'm worth feeling like this. And then that'll set you on this path to really explore ways that um, cultivate more um, ways for you to care for yourself, more ways for you to feel joy and happiness. So um, I know one of the ways that I really started to take care of myself, especially after my fibroid diagnosis was being more mindful of my stress levels and understanding that, you know, I know we like to like give titles to things, especially these days, like soft girl era and things like that. But for real though, like for black women, like I think that is long time that we actually do like stand in our softness and in our femininity and we shed the we shed the the weight of how society has almost shaped us in this no don't get me wrong I think inherently we are strong but I think that the negative part of that is that maybe sometimes pe people can treat us with a lack of um empathy you know in spaces where we absolutely deserve that with a lack of sensitivity a lack of care and consideration and I feel like it causes us to um have to fight and defend ourselves in ways that we aren't really organically designed to. It causes stress on ourselves. And that stress manifests into different things like tumors, i.e. fibroids, you know, and that's that's just the, one of the many things that can happen to you when you're always stressed and you're, you're putting all, you're overtaxing yourself because you are not being heard, respected or understood or treated um, fairly whether it be relationship, family life, work life, you know, all these different areas of life. And so my way of really enhancing and enjoying my life experience was to manage my stress. And that looked like just putting myself first, even at the expense of other people. You know, I have to feel good. And then what I realized is that I don't have to feel guilty about that because the people that really love me are going to want me to feel good too. And I have to really ask myself, well, you know, what what do I really want? If I really want to be happy, I have to trust and believe that the right people are going to come around as I begin to adjust my life to make sure that I'm making decisions that are um, in my best interest and um, also healthy for me. So, um, so yeah, that's what the film was about and that's how it ties into women's wellness. And that's kind of one of the steps that I made personally, you know, just to make sure that I was taking care of myself. And you know, there's so many other things that I do. I just, I really, every day I'm trying to love myself deeper. I'm really trying to, um, just, I, when I, especially when I find myself looking for things outside myself, I, I, Thank God, you know, I'm, I'm more aware these days. So I'll say, okay, noted, you know, and I try to turn that inward and say, okay, well, if I'm looking for approval or validation from this person, in what ways do I need to approve and validate myself? And sometimes that comes up in like spending time with myself or um, maybe disciplining myself a little bit more, but it, I have to spin it back to me. And so that's, you know, one of the ways that I manage my self care. Awesome. So, um, since we as Black women are conditioned to feel guilty about putting ourselves first, um, 
What do you think that we as filmmakers can do to reject that narrative or promote a more um, a more holistic narrative that Black women should reclaim our um, our I guess uh, autonomy and our um, desire to be more selfish in a sense. I mean, that has a very negative connotation to it, but we're losing our lives because we're not doing that. So what do you think that we as filmmakers can do to help change the narrative around? I think that the best way is just to use our medium, right? We have this beautiful medium that is disarming because art is disarming, you know? People look at art like it's this thing to be entertained by and true, you are entertained, but um, because of how our brains and our, and our hearts and our spirits work, we're always absorbing information, right? So art is a beautiful medium to communicate ideas and, and stimulate you know, thoughts in a person. And so I say that to say, we can present ourselves the way we want to be seen and treated. We can tell stories that um, that are not, see, I, I shy away from, I know people are talking about, oh, black pain. And, and I don't, I, I don't buy into that because pain is, is not something that it belongs to black people. Pain is universal. And mm -hmm. I think it is important to address our pain stories of the past, because there are a lot of people who didn't get to tell their own stories and we are their, we are their vessels. Um, on some ancestral stuff. And I believe in that. And I think that their experiences are valuable and we should tell those stories. But um, going back to the main point, when we talk about um, shedding that weight and not wearing the weight of the world or that the world is putting on us, I really think it's about first individually understanding our worth you know, that we are worth knowing, we are worth understanding, we are worth spoiling, we are worth celebrating, we are worth a life of ease, luxury, changing the language, you know, from an individual perspective, changing the language of, um, and this goes back to worth as well. I knew I grew up in a household where things were too expensive and that was always the language. So now we're playing into lack, right? And then how we, how we use art to kind of shift the um, the paradigm here is I think to present these these different levels of existence through these characters so people can kind of indirectly feel what it's like to live a life a little lighter you know mm -hmm. and I think that we can we can reimagine life in different situations and we can magnify that through a story. You know what I mean? And I think that that'll be wonderful. We have so many, like we have a, a presence that has grown in film, but we are so like diverse just within like being black. Blackness is extremely diverse. And then like, if you like, just being a black woman is extremely diverse. Like we all speak differently. Our hair textures are different. Our skin tones are different. Um, like, our, our experiences, depending on our economic status, just is so many, we are such a diverse group just by being um, a woman, you know, that is black. I think that those are some, those are existences. That is an existence, excuse me, that we can explore and expound upon. And we wouldn't easily tire of it because I don't think it's been really presented. I think that when we do show up in the film medium in softer ways, it's often very sexual, nothing wrong with that. But I do think that there's room for the other aspects in which we do come. Some of us, we don't, we don't, a lot of us are not yellers. I'm not a yeller, you know, but oftentimes <laughs> how we show up, you, like like yeah. literally how we show up and how we express ourselves when we are passionate mm -hmm. or upset, or it's always one way, right? right? So how can we tell stories that show the diversity of, Black women, you know, and I think that art and theater, film are the most powerful mediums for people to position themselves as that actor because it's a real life being played out in front of you. And then that person, the audience or in their living room can see themselves in that person. 
And I think that's the most powerful way, you know, to, to, to represent that, what we're talking about. No, absolutely. Um, I love the fact that you said that we are a variety. It's kind of like open up the box of chocolates. Some of us are yellers. Some of us are meek. Some of us are quiet. Some of us, but it all comes kind of like when we came over here on the boat. There were different tribes that would have never met each other in Africa. Rather, and unfortunately, we had to get to know each other, other through slavery. And that's the same thing what we're dealing with now. We have different types of Black people. You know, they like to cup us in a, a cup of just Black, but there are different arrangements of us. You got this shade, this shade, this size, this size, this, this, this genetic, this genetic, this, this tone, this tone. And they've all raised us at the same time. So we can really be any woman you want us to be. And we know that. And I think that's why we're so eclectic. We're so wanted. We're so valued. But again, it gets to us to know our value. And if we don't know our value, if I'm sitting with a great figure, uh, an income figure, and I'm sitting on the operation table, but I am following their instructions versus knowing who I really am, I'm going to go with the majority. So it's really getting to know what, who your body is, your genetics, really diving in and honing in because they do the same experimental experience and research that we can do on our own to know who we really are. We really have to take the time and stop putting trust in everybody else and trusting in ourselves. So agreed. that was very powerful. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I would just want to echo that again, because I think that's something I've definitely noticed. Like, I really resonated with you saying, like, essentially, we're not a monolith, you know, no group is. Um, but that's what we bottled for the longest time as a Black community as a whole. Like, oh, this is what Black people are. And so, yeah, by 2023, thankfully, <laughs> a good number of people are realizing, oh, wait, there's more to this than we think. But um, there was a bit of, um, which you kind of touched on, Nick, you a bit of a new caricature being made where, okay, we're not what they said we were, but here's the new form. They're strong, they're this, they're that. And, you know, obviously there's a range. We can be on one side of the spectrum to the other, but I feel like because we were viewed in such a singular fashion before, there are people within our own community even that are like, no, we wanna see this. So that in showing this new form, any visual of even, a bit of the old one becomes a bad thing where it's like, no, no, no. It's just, I think everything in moderation, mm -hmm. we can have both because both do describe black people. The only issue Absolutely. before is we're not all just this. There's a wide spectrum of every group. So I think it's also on um, others, but also on us to recognize that we might not like a certain depiction of a black person or a black woman that we might be seeing, but that's okay because that doesn't have to speak specifically to me. Um, this one specific character or the story doesn't have to represent the entire Black diaspora. It's just one of many. If you see it happening time and time again, that's when you know you have an issue. But um, just one specific specific um, representation doesn't have to speak specifically to you. And I, I'm hoping and praying that that is something that will change more often too. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, we have to absolutely accept our own diversity. Um, I, one thing I see, and um, so Koya, you may be able to tap in on that, but we we can absolutely be hyper hypercritical because maybe, may, I don't know, maybe maybe we've been exhausted, you know, to a certain extent. But um, I always I always think everything boils down to the individual experience. I personally am not exhausted. I just look at everything as like a smorgasbord of stuff, and then I just kind of pick what resonates with me during this point in my life. And I have no qualms about the other stuff. You know, it just doesn't resonate with me. Maybe it resonated with me like five years ago, but now I'm in a different space, but I don't have complaints about it. I think when we encounter like people who have like, a like they're very, very critical, I don't think they realize how much harm, you know, um, that is actually being done in that. I think it comes from a personal space of exhaustion. And what I pray for us as a whole is just 
continued self-awareness and continued healing so that some of that old stuff that doesn't even belong to us, honestly, it's not mm -hmm. ours. It's just stuff that was kind of imposed on us. And, and in a way, maybe our cells have kind of wrapped around it. So maybe a little bit more difficult to release, but I pray for just more self-awareness on the individual level so that as a whole, mm -hmm. we can really own more of the landscape. And, and here I'm talking about film because the only like heartache for me is like, I'm like, ah, please stop. We don't own enough to be fighting like this. You know, we don't own enough to do this to each other. Let's just, you know what? I don't even care. Like if, if somebody gets in the door, whatever they want to do, let them do it. Because at one point, none of us were able to get in the door mm -hmm. and everybody was just saying, oh, well, why can't we get in the door? Now you're in the door. Now you're like, you know, attacking it. And so it's kind of, counter counter um, productive at this point, but just kind of tapping because what you said was very, very interesting to me and something that I hope that they actually do like panel discussions on and um, in Black Hollywood. I think it's a discussion that we actually do need to hash out when it comes to how we are allowing ourselves to thrive in this space mm -hmm. so that we can be conduits for the stories that we want to tell and and allow for those stories to be just as diverse as we truly do exist, you know. Right. No, I, I, I think that we're moving towards that. Um, but I think that there's always going to be a pushback, and we have to just be resilient and not allow that pushback to to stop us from progressing and in, from in the industry by telling these stories um, because a lot of shows that we put out there in progress have been canceled like after one season or in the middle of a season then they're not renewed so it's like we have to find alternative means to be able to continue to tell these stories even though mainstream may say I don't see where there's any value in them being on our network um, but tying that back into self-care, I think that um, we have to continue to tell these stories for our own mental health because if we don't see ourselves represented and we don't see the breadth of our experiences reflected on television, then we may, as a community, begin to think that either they're not relevant in the mainstream and that they're not worthy of being told. And that that increases the anxiety and, and low self-esteem that our youth may have in themselves because they don't see where other people value our experiences. So um, it, it, it's a, a larger discussion. And like you said, Nikki, um, I do hope that these panels are happening because we do need to talk about it. It's important. So you can start here on this podcast. Yeah. You guys have the slates live. and coffee live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think whether we like it or not, we have definitely stepped into our ancestors' place as in fighting the good fight, by getting, getting into bad trouble or good trouble is what they say. And that is promoting the word, the awareness, the fight of us in color in uh, film and TV. Uh, we know that it's ran by the majority and there are not that many platforms of color that are discussing these issues. We are allowing politics and monetary economics to pay our way to be silent. And we're also allowing the others to create our own stories. So I think we should take advantage of this era and this time and laying the foundation. There are younger people that are watching this, gen generations that are coming up that have no idea until they step into the realm of a production assistant and they see it for themselves. And then where where are they to look? Where are they to look to get knowledge and wisdom and encouragement and empowerment? But here, so we are stepping into, and uh, you know, sorry, NECA, but Atlanta is it. 
Atlanta is the foreground of Martin Luther King. So we're doing our job. <laughs> yeah, Atlanta is showing up. Yeah, Atlanta, Atlanta is showing up. I think that what I, and like I said, I, I, I'm hesitant to complain. I just, I want us to believe in ourselves so much that we do things in excellence. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of us just feel like, okay, anything, let's just do it, you know, because right. people feel mm -hmm. like they're able to now. And, and the truth is, I think that um, maybe we've always been able, you know, it's just a matter of self-awareness and, um, and because the numbers are there, you know, uh, the economic status in, in, in some respects is there, the ideas and creativity is there. And, and even now, like a lot of us are creating with uh, very few resources than maybe our counterparts, you know, would have very like much fewer opportunities, much fewer me meetings, and we're making the thing happen and getting distribution. So um, I think that the next step would be, okay, so we understand that we can do what we want. Now, how high like of a level can we create on? You know, and I think we have to believe and trust in our own divine intelligence enough to to execute on that level instead of kind of reaching for low hanging fruit, you know, for lack of, well, I can't say for lack, that is a perfect phrase for let's um, let's not accept the bare minimum and let's not perform at our bare minimum either, you know, but I think that we are also heading that way as well. I think as we continue to just peel back layers of ourselves of our creativity, of how we can show up in these spaces. And I think that the digital era has really, you know, allowed for that, you know, to kind of be an idea. Um, I think that we'll see more excellence come out of the Southeast region, you know, from black filmmakers. Um, I'm going to say something a little controversial. So if you want to cut it out, <laughs> feel free. But I agree with you 100% that we should strive for excellence and putting out the best project and product as we possibly can. But in Atlanta, and those of us who are here, we have seen mediocrity make millions. And if that is a pattern that people can see as the ability to replicate, that is going to be hard to then get them to want to do better because then they can say, well, this person, they didn't care about continuity. They didn't care about wardrobe. They didn't care about uh, a very strict production. Oh, what a cup, what a cup, what a cup did we have on self-care. That was amazing, ladies. I'm full. I've I've got my sip on. I'm filled <laughs> up on this episode. I don't know about you, but this has been great. We thank you again. Plates and coffee, nourish, educate, and empowerment. That's what we do. Until then, bye. And they made a lot of money, so why should I? So I agree with you, but how do we get them to agree with you? That's a very good point. And you know what? I gotta not I gotta backtrack a little bit and say the truth is, is that there's an audience for everything. That's the truth, right? And so there's intelligent comedy, there's slapstick comedy, there's like, you know, um more urban comedy and it's cut for different audiences. And so, you know, when you, I, and I know I, I got you, <laughs> but, but there is also, you remember what was it? Dame Dash and his camp. They had like all these like hood movies that came out and they made a lot of money, you know, from that. So I think that what we really have to ask ourselves, this boils down to, am I really a filmmaker? Am I really an actress? Am I really a director? Or do I just mm -hmm. like the validation that comes from that? Some of us, some of us just need good, like a therapist, right? <laughs> some of us just need therapy. All of us are not are not filmmakers, okay? Some of us just like the validation that comes from the title and the attention that comes from the title. 
which is why, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of people just stagnate, you know, in, in certain respects, um, they don't continue to evolve. And, um, but I think that honestly, that's true of every, every era, you know, um, people, the, the right people will continue to, to rise. Um, but as far as that point is concerned, I don't really think that it's about convincing everybody, but I do think it's about for every artist, even myself, I had to really sit with myself and say, okay, Nick, it's okay to be still. It's okay if nothing's happening right now. Um, because and I was having a conversation with an, a fellow filmmaker last night who's an Emmy Award winner. And um, we were just talking about the pace of things. And we both agreed that we'd rather make three quality, excellent, award-winning pieces that stand the test of time over the span of five years rather than pump out three films per year that are mm -hmm. mediocre, that fade, you know, that are subpar, that nobody remembers, you know. Yeah, it makes money, but I guess you have to figure out, okay, well, why are you in it? I think that there's money either way. I think that you have to decide, do you want to be a hamster getting your money or do you want it to come with ease? I want mine with ease and luxury. I want to write scripts on beaches. I want to travel the world and talk to people. And I want to feel alive every time I create, because I believe that purpose is always prosperous. I believe is that, that normal. Not because you're, but is, is that the norm? Because we have Ma Mara Brock Akil. And you remind, you, you give me her. You give me the same aura, the same vibe. But even though she had to go through a kink in her relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Jump in her personal life, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, yeah, when we talk about excellence, I think that there are people that just simply don't care. You know, they, uh, they get other things out of it. And we have to let them get that. And there are people that will resonate with that. Um, you know, um, the greatest example I think that people were hypercritical of was Tyler Perry. But, you know, I'll, I'll say it's a testimony because he's grown as well, you know, as, as his notoriety and bankability has grown, so has his art. And, um, like, I'm actually curious about this 6 8 you know, film coming out. And uh, Carrie Washington is an extraordinary actress, you know. Um, so I think that what that does for me is allow me to say I don't have to have everything right now. I can just start with what I've got right now. And so I'll say even there, there, there is something to take from everything, but I think that he found an audience and I'm just, I'm just isolating that because he's the most obvious one. Right. But he had an audience and he worked that and we have to do the business and art balance. But I think that there was power in his stories, you know? So a lot of this stuff that I'm, when I'm talking about lacking excellence, it's kind of just coming from nowhere. There's no energy in it. It's just they want to do something because maybe they have the resources or they know somebody. And um, it's really about just them. And and again, again, like I said, some people just need a therapist to to work out, you know, issues of validation and, and approval. It's not really about being a filmmaker, but it's it's about them. It's not about the public. And, you know, everybody don't feel like me. And that's OK. But I feel like this is an active service. I feel like art is an active service. And you always serve yourself because it's yours. It's flowing through you. You you are the vehicle, the vessel, the conduit. So it always serves you. But you have got to, when you let it flow through you and it goes out into the world, it now serves everybody else. And I know what I want to do is I want that to live on the highest, best possible stage so that whoever needs to get that message or to be entertained or to be inspired or to release the grief, you know, can, can receive that message. And so um, everybody has a different approach. I think excellence can be presented in different ways though. You know, there can be excellence in cinematography and maybe the acting may not be that great. 
Um, but I think that what, what somebody like a Tyler has, um, who was very criticized for his lack of excellence, you know, and from the Hollywood spectrum, he had excellence in, um, in storytelling. And uh, there are a lot of us who just needed a very grounded way to have a conversation, you know, and to feel seen and to feel understood. And I think that's what he excelled in. And I'm really shout out to him for that. There are a lot of other people that are trying to duplicate that. It's not coming from anywhere though. And I think that that's where we get the lack of excellence. And it's just kind of throwing anything out there, seeing what sticks. And, and I think that's a, an a, incredible abuse of a gift, you know, of any kind, whether it be financial or resources or, or art. I think you're diluting your art. I think you're wasting your resources. It's, it's an incredible abuse of it. So I think that whatever excellence means for you, just tap into excellence. It, when something is done in excellence, it, it kind of helps these, these neighboring things. You know what I mean? So um, if maybe you're not, I've been on projects as an actress where maybe the writing wasn't as strong, but because the acting is superior, it just bleeds over into everything else. Um, but somebody cared about having excellence in, in, in whatever way they could grab it present. And I think that that's more, probably the more important message is how can you access excellence, you know, to, in order to amplify your project and, and instead of coming from the place of, oh, man, let's make a movie, let's make a movie, you know, and it just being a thing where you get to puff your chest out, you know. Um, I think that those are the two like contrasting um, positions that I'm, I'm really like looking at. I don't think we can convince it, you know, anybody. I think that the people, even that the people I'm talking about, I think that they'll just have to get tired. You know, like, <laughs> I don't think that they're going to be like, yeah, you're right, Nick. They're going to be like, <laughs> you know, I think that they'll just have to get tired. You know, they'll see when, um, because there are a lot of people in this industry that come in waves you know all the time and and somebody is hot every season you know and to fight this fight is exhausting if there's nothing to sustain it and the only sustainable thing is like the core of the individual you know like the the attention is not sustainable you know you get worn thin from that like that stuff is not sustainable it has to be for something deeper than that it has to be for some kind of purpose you know no, absolutely. I, I think we can also say that excellence is like an AKA purpose, because like you mentioned, there are many that duplicate um, Tyler Perry and Spike Lee and all the greats that came before us, but it doesn't really come across as that because they're trying to duplicate their recipe, but you gotta, you have to put the passion behind the recipe. You can be a good cook, but if you don't cook like grandma, grandma has some pain in that cook. She has some struggle in that cook. She had some life in that cook. So it's not going to taste just like hers, but it'll look like her cake. But it really won't give you that kick like her cake. So it's like really that purpose driven uh, that we can all say. Um, man, this is this has been an amazing episode. I don't know about you guys. Are we done already? I have been fed. <laughs> I've had my cup of coffee and we do coffee with a K because it's not necessarily coffee. We do alternatives of everything. It's a mixture of everything but the norm. And that, then that's what Slays and Coffee is. It's everything but the norm or what you're going to get. And this episode was definitely everything you're, you got, you got, but, you know, a little bit, some, some more stuff, some more excellence and purpose. Love so, it. We want to thank Nikki. You're amazing. What a beautiful and balanced soul. I cannot wait to see what else. What else do you have coming out that we can promote today? Well, I have a couple movies out already. So if anybody wants to check out some stuff, Till Love Comes is on Peacock and um, Charlie Movie, um, Atlanta Favorite. That's on Amazon and a couple others. And um, let's see. <laughs> it's always stuff that you want to be like, oh yeah, check this out in like May, but you know, you obviously can't say anything yet. But I will say, you know, just stay tuned. Um, social media, if you guys have it, um, 
my website if you guys rock old school um is it for, all your name nikki lachey yeah so official nikki lachey is the instagram and facebook and the website official nikki lachey and um there'll be some announcements coming out soon but for now where i'm focused on is just being in a constant state of creation and so i have uh, this movie of course that you know I'm working on uh, medical apartheid and um, connecting the dots with that. And it's progressing beautifully. There's um, it's, I'll say it's just, it's on the right path and it's, I'm even surprised at how everything is unfolding. So that, and um, I have a, a scripted slate and an unscripted slate that, um, that are in the works, you know, right now and um, a stage production as well. So it's just, I'm staying, I'm staying busy. So even in the midst of people hiring me, um, I think it's just the lifeblood of a creator. Like we, we can't sit still, we go outside, we think about a whole movie in our head, you know, it's just, it's like, <laughs> you know, and so, so I'm like writing stuff down. So I'm always in the state of creation. And um, yeah, just stay, just stay tuned and, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Love it. Ah, it's been amazing. You Thank guys you, look out for Nikki, a.k.a. Carrie Washington, a.k.a. The Great, <laughs> a.k.a. Oh, my God. She's in her own lane. But she is, I can definitely, I'm giving, I'm giving you the energy that she is going to be up there and our generations are going to see her and watch her and like, oh my gosh, she's giving me this, she's giving me that, she's giving me slay, she's giving me education and empowerment. I feel it. No, 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 really, I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I took all that in. I received and believed yes. all that in. Yes. Well, thank you again for joining the Slates and, um best of wishes prayers to you on your journey thank you thank you thank you nikki bye ladies bye, bye.